video. Aloha, everybody. Thanks for coming out. That's kind of a quiet. Aloha. Aloha. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, first of all, I, I, we'll do introductions, and I'll do a little uh, talk a little bit about our company. But I would like this to be a conversation. There's probably a lot of great technologists here. Whether you're very mature in terms of like understanding, whether you're curious about what it is, or you're just here to support the true organization, uh, or do some networking. Regardless of your um, entry to be in the room, please ask questions. Uh, we do have a lot of slides. We're a consulting company, so we do slides very well. Um, but we would love to have a conversation. So please feel free to interject, ask questions. Um, Kaimi and Summer will introduce themselves, but they're the real stars of this presentation. They're uh, two leaders on our team, um, our, 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 our chief technology office team that represents here in the uh, Pacific. So really quickly, we'll go through um, the agenda. So we'll do some quick intros of us. I'll talk a little bit about Booz Allen and what we do in our mission. Um, we'll do a quick brief history around what natural language processing is. Um, as a team will go over, it's made a ton of advances just within the past decade and we'll kind of talk about why it's gone from something that's probably been around 50, 60 years really in theory, but why it's accelerated so much in the past decade and why, and why so many clients are kind of whatever industry or market you're working with, it's becoming sort of something that everyone is asking around. Um, one of those things is around open source models. That's been an accelerant for NLP, so we'll talk about that, how you can, how you look at it, how you can integrate it within um, your solutions and within your company. And then we have some applications, how we can do it with it, looking at open source data, so social media, um, a search engine, and then also with a healthcare use case as well. Okay, cool. All right, so uh, my name is Ed. Uh, I'm our chief technology officer for Booz Allen's Indo-Pacific business. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the company overview, but, but really we have um, 450 talented consultants that do predominantly DOD support within the region that spans Korea, Japan, Guam, Singapore, uh, Alaska, and here in Hawaii. Um, my team here uh, is primarily in charge with working with our uh, colleagues, with, for our clients to, which, to help <clears throat> satisfy and achieve critical missions for our DOD clients, but from the lens of using tech. And so that can range from anything from machine learning and AI to advanced cyber, to IT transformation, to application development, engineering, immersive, digital twin, you name it, we kind of do it for our clients. Um, but this is probably the most pervasive in terms of the demand signal from our clients is around everybody's asking for AI, everyone's asking for ML, some know what that is, some don't, but they ask for it anyways. So our job is to kind of help demystify it and, um, and to help make it a reality for them. So I've been on the island for three years. Uh, I've been in the consulting industry for 20 plus years. Uh, was born and raised in Maryland, right outside DC. Had an amazing opportunity to come here and my wife and my daughters gave a big thumbs up. So three years later, it's the best move that we've made. We consider this to be our home. We're very passionate about what we do for our clients, but just to build on what Leilani said, um, working for our clients is the number one thing to do, but what we do in the community is as, as important. So we get so much from the island, we get so much from being here that it's our responsibility, I think, to give back to the community and to do it in ways that we're passionate about, which is around technology. So really, we're here to help other folks have conversations around tech, how to make it real for other people, and also how to do a lot of STEM initiatives with um, the Keiki on island. So I'll let Summer introduce herself. Oh. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Summer, and uh, I am a... Um, artificial intelligence um, subject matter expert here for um, Booz Allen and then specifically for the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so my uh, PhD is in complex systems and brain sciences, which is essentially like computational neuroscience. Um, and then uh, I studied, uh, or I worked some more at Johns Hopkins after that, and then uh, sort of got into the field of data science where I have um, been working with Booz Allen for almost five years now. And uh, I started out in DC, uh, and I've worked with um, all kinds of clients. So uh, I've worked with the FDA, the CDC, um, the uh, ONC, so a lot of like health and sort of civil work. But then um, after about two years I came out here to Hawaii where I've been working primarily with the uh, DOD. So, um, you know, not just on island, but just in the region in general. Um, and it's, it's been really fun and I, I really enjoy the work. Um, I 
used to, so when I was a neuroscientist, uh, like fun facts, I guess here, um, I used to study uh, music cognition and creativity. Uh, so we would take jazz musicians and stick them in the MRI and have them improv and then also play for memory and kind of compare the signals, uh, which is really fun. And uh, so that was my like former career. Um, but nowadays I get to do things like, uh, you know, predicting, uh, you know, when uh, people are going to become sick after dialysis or things like, um, you know, helping the, the DOD understand and parse through uh, 60 years of data. So um, it's really fun and, and I, I enjoy it and I really love living here. Uh, Kaimi, you're next. Hello everyone. So my name is Kaimi Kahihikolo. So if the name didn't give it away, I'm native Hawaiian, uh, born and raised all over Oahu. Uh, so I've been a data scientist with Booz Allen Hampton for about three and a half years now. Uh, prior to that, I actually got my degree in astrophysics from UH Manoa. And before that, I actually went to Kamehameha School's Kapalama. So definitely local boy, born and raised. Um, currently, I support our CDC clients on their COVID-19 response, uh, specifically providing big data analytics support on all of their massive amounts of structured medical records. And when I say big data, I actually mean big data. Uh, our team helps to process and analyze over a petabyte of structured medical records, which if you don't know what a petabyte is, that's about a million gigabytes of structured data. So it's absolutely massive. Uh, but during my time th uh, throughout Bruce Allen and university, I've done probably most major fields of artificial intelligence, whether natural language processing, which we're going to talk about today, computer vision in terms of looking at images and videos, and a wide variety of other stuff as well. So that's me. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I'll do a quick, quick overview of what of our company, Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, so if you go to the next slide. And one is we are not a law firm. That's what I get a lot. So uh, we are actually a, a consulting firm. We, we're a 100 plus year consulting firm. Uh, an interesting fact is we actually invented the word management consulting. So that term that a lot of you know, Deloitte's, Accenture's, KPMG, um, that whole term of doing management consulting originated from Booz Allen. And I think in the past 20 to 25 years, we've done not a pivot, but we've embraced to say that we are an IT consulting company. So most, if not all of our capabilities center around bringing complex IT solutions to solving client missions. So our true purpose of what we do is we still are problem solvers for our clients, so that's what a consultant is, but the lens in which we do it is around focusing on technology solutions and modern complex solutions. So we already work at the forefront of advanced technology to uncover and solve challenges. Um, one thing, just kind of like who we are, we're innovators, right? Um, we have a brand, our clients have expectations, and so one thing that they expect of us is to bring new, um, new uh, solutions to what their problems are. And so we like to embrace the idea of baking in innovation in our delivery. So it's not something that we do in a lab with white coats necessarily is something that we do shoulder to shoulder with our clients, and we try and do that on an everyday basis. Start incrementally, and then we start to take them on a journey. I talked about problem solving, but all of our technologists, I think they all have their disciplines, and they're very, um, some are very, very clear about what they want to do, and some are just curious to learn new things, but at the heart of it is that they want to solve problems. It's like puzzles, right? And so we have a team of really good puzzle solvers, I like to think. Um, another thing about our company is that we're only as good as our partnerships. Right, so the relationships we make with our clients is really what underpins our business. And we're changing, so we like to disrupt. Right? The only way that you can advance is maybe you take a step back sometimes, or you have to disrupt, or you have to break the rules. And so we do pride ourselves in, um, my bosses will say we are very um, compliant. So I do want to say that we manage risk, but in the work that we do is we also are changing as well. Next slide. And so a little bit about the company. We're founded in 1914. Our headquarters is in McLean, Virginia. We're actually close to 30,000 employees now. I joined when we were about 22, so that's a pretty large jump in the past nine years. Um, and we're going to get over $8 billion of revenue. Some stats that really make up who we are, 65% um, of our business is within the defense um, sector. So 30% of our employees are veterans, which we're very proud of. 10% um, of our employees speak two or more languages. We're a very diverse company. Um, 44 of our employees have advanced degrees, masters or higher. 20% of our employees are under 30. And the one that I'm most proud of, and which is my team is actually made up of the same metric, is 55% of our leadership team is comprised of women. And so I have close to 30 people on my technical team, and more than half of that team are females, which I think is really great. Um, next slide. Okay, and these are some of the things that we have. We're very proud of our company. Um, 
Forbes Best Companies for Women, Forbes uh, Best Employers for Diversity. And just a little bit about our company here locally, I mentioned that, is of that 30,000 people, we have 450 people here and we're growing uh, and we're dispersed. And a lot of these things are at the firm level, kind of national level, but we've been on island for 25 years plus and have done a lot within our community, a lot within a lot of different organizations, nonprofit, partnerships, uh, academia, and obviously with the DOD and other government organizations. So we're very proud to be here. I'm very proud to give back. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Summer and Kaimi. All right. Uh, you can, yes, you can continue to okay, uh, be the smith of the this, clicker. the expert clicker. Is it cool if I stand here? Does that work for you? All right. So yeah, just to start off, um, I'm curious about this crowd. So how many people do we have in the room that you consider yourself a tech person? You have learned or at least tried to learn like Python or C or some sort of programming language. Anybody in here? Anybody? Everybody in here. Awesome. Perfect. Great. So uh, I won't spend a ton of time, you know, belaboring simple things for you. Um, so what is natural language processing? It's essentially just taking text from text into new numbers, right? That's like at the bare, bare bones level. Um, and then we use the representation of that text in these numbers, which we'll talk about how we can do this in multiple ways, to then make models, gain insights, make a search engine, all kinds of things. Um, so it sounds complex, but it's just analyzing text. Next slide, please. All right, so the, uh, you know, Ed was saying there's a lot of demand signal for, not, for NLP in this region, um, particularly in, you know, government uh, sectors because 80% of their data, this is not like a hard number here, but it's just things we typically see, is if you go into an organization that maybe isn't doing data science yet, and you say like, okay, where's your data? What have you got for me? You're gonna see that most of it is the, what we call unstructured data, right? So this is like not something in a nice Excel spreadsheet where you've got columns and features and it's nice and clean, right? Um, it's probably not even numbers. It's a bunch of presentations, it's PDFs, it's PowerPoint presentations, we see that a lot. Um, help desk tickets, surveys, social media, really like audio, also audio and video. Um, so all of that is considered this unstructured data, which then we need to turn into structured data so that we can gain some insight and do some inference. Um, and that's kind of where this is like the sweet spot of like why NLP is useful, right? Because even just to get it into this state, we do a little bit of NLP and then, you know, we can do some of these things. Um, and a lot of times what we do too is we like marry these things together, right? So we can take some of this like information about, um, let's say maybe you have different cars and you want to see fuel, but you also want to look at maybe the reviews of those cars. And so you kind of mush these things together and you make a big model out of all of it. Uh, so there's a untapped latent potential here. Next slide, please. So some common tasks that use NLP that you probably either interact with every day or it's at least under the hood of things that you interact with every day are things like obviously search, right? Since, you know, the internet became a thing, I, for those of us that remember pre Alta Vista, right? Like you had to know where you wanted to go on the internet to like talk to people. I remember that. And it was like so fun when you could like find other people. You know, and then web crawler, Ask Jeeves, obviously Google is like what we use nowadays, Bing, uh, there's a few more, but you know, searching is like the most basic and common way that we use NLP. Um, translation is another one that's just really become much, much better very recently. Uh, question, and question answering, we'll talk about that in detail. Summarization, so this one's a cool one, Kaimi's gonna show you some of that too. Classification, um, just basically trying to make things filterable, right? So not just search, but you also want to filter. Text generation, so this is where like it can write a story from a prompt, but this also gets used under the hood for all of this other stuff, just mathematically speaking. Um, sentence similarity, again, this goes back to search and text to speech, speech to text, right? So this is Siri, this is Alexa, this is you know anything where you're taking audio to text or text to audio also had serious advances uh, in the last decade. Next slide, please. That's not an exhaustive list, obviously, but you know, 
we could only fit so much on one slide. It's got to be a pretty slide. All right, so this, the point of this slide is just to say that, you know, over time we have had uh, an incredible increase in complexity of these language models, right? So we've got, you start out with like your basic frequency-based methods, which is literally just like, how many times does this document say this word? You have millions of words for, let's say, a corpus of 100 documents, right? This is like the basic way. This is, you know, done in the 50s, the 60s with like linguistics when it was just um, people and paper and really not a lot of computers, right? Because we just didn't have the compute power at the time. So the compute power <laughs> has really allowed us to accelerate since then, right? So we have other things like um, word embeddings. So that was kind of the next big uh, advent, which, you know, about 2013, where we're, I'll go, I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, then we have things like, uh, you know, Google word to vec which is really still kind of a very popular word embedding, which is where you're taking representations of these words instead of just counting them. Um, and then we have things like, uh, you know, Stanford Glove, where, um, you know, they're training things on the entire corpus of Wikipedia or the entire Google News corpus. Um, but what's really notable is in 2017, the NeurIPS paper, so NeurIPS is the um, like AI ML conference that uh, used to be for just the nerds, but now it's like a very thing where like lots of uh, very wealthy people go nowadays. Um, anyway, there came this paper called Attention is All You Need. So this idea of attention, right, is, was new and it revolutionized this field because it allowed us to kind of think about training not, a model not just on kind of like the words and the words around it, but it's really learning the context of the words. Um, I'll show you kind of a visual example of that in a second. So this, I like to put a little explosion here because it, it exploded from here. I didn't want to just fill the slide with craziness, but really like you know you so you start off with google bert which is really still a very very popular what we call a large language model um and it's it's trained on i believe bert is all of google news right and more, I think. more probably yeah, more. <laughs> yeah so the base is trained on that and then um Kaimi's going to tell you more about this but you can then take it and do more with it um, and so then we've got like OpenAI coming out with GPT-2 and 3. I don't know if you remember this, but they didn't even want to release it because they were like, it's not ethical for us to release this model because people could make fake things with it and do, do evil things, which it's a valid thing to think about, right? Um, but they did release it. Um, then we've got just basically other forms of BERT, Distill BERT, Roberta, all of these different like things. Then we've got Google's T5. So, in terms of explosion and like uh, compute power, so here we start off with like CPUs. We're getting into GPUs at this point, but then Google actually invents their own hardware to train these large language models. That is what it's for, called a TPU, um, which I believe is how they came up with like the T5, possibly. Um, I think the TPU started earlier, but yeah, you're on the same. Yeah. No, no, earlier than that, but that's kind of how they were naming oh, it. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so still now things are being generated, larger and larger language models, but I actually just saw a paper the other day where they were like, oh, actually, if it's just really wide and flat rather than deep, it does really well, which I was like, oh, this is going to make people crazy. So that's the point of this. Time, complexity, it goes that way. Next oh, slide. And also oh, please. Cost. Yeah. I'm so getting to that okay. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So this is another like little example of just like, some basic sort of text, what we call named entity recognition. So this is like a combination of an algorithm and a model where it's pulling out people, places, things, locations, I just said that, sorry, organizations, laws. There's like a lot of sort of out of the box things that you can use with various Python libraries as our like go-to. Um, so it's like pulling out that this person, that's a person, it knows that that's a school. Actually, it doesn't know it's a school, it knows that that's like a place. Um, and so this is useful for those search functions. It's also useful for linking records. So like think libraries and, and things like that, or just knowledge management in general, for those of you that uh, know what that means. <laughs> um, so yeah, next slide. This was just like a little. 
Okay, so embedding. So I talked about how we went from like frequency to embedding. So next forward one. Okay. Oh no. Ideally, I'd like them both. I can fix it on the spot if you'd like. Otherwise, just let's go to that one first. Okay. So let's say we have a sentence that says um, the cat sat on the mat or something like that, and you know what we want to do is embed the uh, the essence of the word and so here if you think of it this this is called a, a vector it's just a row of numbers and embedding is just a representation of something with numbers that's all it is we just like to intimidate people with words um, so you know you had things like cat which may be represented these are sort of maybes like by living being feline human gender the reason this is useful is because then when we go to compare it to another embedded vector these two, if we do just simple linear algebra subtraction, these two are going to be closer together, right? Cat and dog, sorry, cat and kitten are going to be closer together in this, like, let's call it a pretend space than cat and dog, right? And so that's kind of some really fun, like, and you could even do crazy stuff like, you know, man plus king, like the embedded vector for man, add king, and then subtract queen gives you woman like you don't have to understand that right now but let's just say you can do lots of fun addition and subtraction with this so this is like word to vec the google's word to vec kind of thing so uh next all right here's my sentence so the cat sits on the mat so this is actually looking at like the target word all the words behind it and then the more advanced ones are also kind of looking at all the words in front of it and trying to kind of if you will predict um, you know, what word is going to come next. So that's just the idea behind that. Thank you, Kaimi. All right, so let's talk about money. So large language models were the next iteration. I'm not going to show you the attention network stuff or really try to get into that because it's kind of a lot. Um, also, you don't need to know it to like enjoy this. So uh, like I was saying, TPU was like the new hardware. Um, the other thing that, that you get out of this is like Google has invested what? Millions of dollars. They didn't release it and say, like, we spent $3 million. But somebody went in and, and tried to, like, calculate what they thought it would cost, kind of, like, based on what they knew about servers and whatnot. And so they, they've estimated, like, $1.3 million for Google's T5, $4.6 million for GPT-3, just to develop this model, which they have released to us, the mere public, that we get to download and use at our leisure, which is great. Um, and so what happens is you take these models, which are trained, you know, in a way that literally wouldn't even be possible for people like us, right? Money and compute time, right? Um, so we can then take them and fine tune them, right? Because we can take that model, we can point it at our data and then do what's called fine tuning. So then we can get things like conceptual search, abstractive summarization, cute question and answering, all kinds of like this fun stuff that we use today. Um, Kaimi, anything you got on this one about money and? Um, well, basically just, yeah, over time, it, these models got more and more complex because they have to solve harder and harder problems with increasing accuracy. Um, the models that we originally had definitely couldn't solve some of the problems that we're trying to solve today. And it, obviously, it, the money starts increasing and increasing. And these numbers don't even factor in the money for staffing an entire team of PhDs oh, yeah. and the training and all that stuff. That's just, com that's just computing time. And it doesn't even factor the number, yeah, like physical days or that these models take to train. They're absolutely ridiculous. Sometimes they take an entire month using an entire. Oh, yeah, 24-7. Yeah, 24-7, entire month of an entire AWS facility all chugging away for a while. So it's. They get really expensive. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add, and I think one thing I was talking with Leilani about is that for those of you who are supporting different industries and you're thinking about how to institute something like as complex as natural language processing within the data that you have, the key takeaway here is that something that would take, regardless even you had unlimited funds, sometimes it's time, right? Time to market. And this is an accelerant. So we, we've done studies where we can now tell a client that if you want to implement a pretty complex NLP solution, but you have the data, you have a place to host it, and you have a stack to, um, to handle it, you could probably do something that may take 18 months, you can get, get it done in three months. And that's a huge 
thing to say when you're trying to say that to investors, or you're trying to talk to clients, or you're trying to make some efficiencies within your organization. Yeah. It's not an easy thing, because I talk to Summer. Summer always reminds me that it's not easy, but it does become an accelerant, right? And this is the main thing of why NLP has become such one of the more, um, I think it's because it's, it's more available and the barrier to entry is much lower. That, that's why I think companies are more open to see how they can apply to that slide that had all the different um, kind of sub solutions within the NLP umbrella, how they could kind of apply it to their data set. So this has been kind of a game changer for us. And within the DOD space, um, we could talk about a lot of the things we're using NLP for in the intelligence space, logistics, right? We're using NLP um, and kind of making uh, old data relevant again by looking at using OCR technology. So all the use cases which you can apply is like kind of mind blowing. And you can kind of get from inception to maybe like a prototype within three to four months, which is, which is something you couldn't say years ago. So that's one of the things that we wanted to share with some of you representing different industries and markets within the island yeah. and kind of the trepidation about going into high tech is that some of these things are not as expensive as they used to be. It still takes some consideration and some infrastructure, but it's much more accessible than it used to be in the past. So. All right, moving on. Oh, okay, so this is just a little example of like, when we were talking about attention is all you need, is that like major paper? This is an example of, it's actually a super complex example, but I think it illustrates the idea nicely, which is this is a combination of a computer vision algorithm as well as an NLP like kind of stuck together. Don't worry about that, but just think about that. It knows that this is a woman throwing a Frisbee in a park. So this is the mask of the attention from this computer vision model. And you can see kind of what it's paying attention to and inferring things or really like abstracting actual text from what it was paying attention to. So if you just kind of think about the whole idea of attention and these transformer networks kind of like this, but for text. Clear as mud, right? <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, so that's uh, my turn. So All right. awesome. So what Summer showed you is just a high level introduction to what is natural language processing. And, and again, reinforcing the idea that these absolutely massive complex models were trained and a lot of money was dumped into them. So I actually want to jump into a bunch of rapid fire demonstrations of actually using NLP and how it can look like for you. So I have three just rapid fire demos to show you. Um, it is important to mention uh, that with a couple caveats. One, so if we mention any specific tools, models, platforms, et cetera, you know, there are tons of alternatives. We just purely mentioned them just as an example. There are, again, tons of alternatives uh, nowadays. Um, and the other thing is that although it may look simple to, in, in a demonstration, uh, applying them for your use cases, requirements, and restrictions may take a lot more work or maybe not, not much work at all. So it entirely depends on a case-by-case -case basis. And since we have a tech savvy crowd, you know, as he's going through these demos, um, feel free to ask questions because what he's going to show you is a little bit of like how to get your hands dirty really quickly and also where to go even for the long term because this is exactly where we pull our models from. Awesome. So I'm going to tell you about one tool we use called Hugging Face. So what is Hugging Face? So it's a, a community data science platform. And it's basically a curation of, or a collection of curated ML models and data sets from the open source community, different organizations, and even research universities contribute their cutting edge research and models to this platform called Hugging Face. Um, so, why is, so why should we use something like, well, why should we use Hugging Face or something like Hugging Face? Well, it contains pre-trained models for a variety of common and uncommon NLP tasks. I think last time I looked, there's about 80,000 models on Hugging Face that you can choose from for a variety of applications. And like we kind of kept hammering, large companies such as Meta, Microsoft, Google regularly contribute their models to this space. And this really is important because you want to remember to don't reinvent the wheel. Um, building these custom NLP solutions from scratch uh, requires specialized knowledge, collecting massive amounts of data, you know, petabytes of data, uh, and incurring high compute costs. Um, however, in this case, companies, these large companies already fronted the multi-million dollar bill that we can benefit from instead of doing everything from scratch. So how do you use Hugging Face again, or something like Hugging Face? So they have a few different options. The first is uh, through their user-friendly web interface, which is good for like exploring their different models and playing around with them in a sandbox environment. Um, but when it comes to the production side, you can access all their models programmatically, or they even have their own paid solution they can use as well. Um, in today's demonstration, I'm going to show you some examples through their, their web interface. 
again, let's get our hands actually dirty and look at how we can use ML models, or these NLP models. OK, so the first demonstration I'm going to show off is something called sentiment analysis. So sentiment analysis is a very important and it's actually one of the most common like introduction NLP things we do. <laughs> um, so what NLP or sentiment analysis is, is an approach for you to identify emotional tone from a piece of text. So for example, I have three examples on the side of the screen about John Doe and his varying opinions of pie. So when he says, I love pie, that can be perceived as a positive sentiment. But if he were to tweet, I hate pie, you know, that, that could be perceived as a negative sentiment. Meanwhile, if he says pie is pie, you know, uninformative but neutral. Okay. So, but there, there are a variety of use cases, use cases or something like this. So, what's up? So when, when you put a sentence into there, does it have to be like a proper sentence? Like, no, it doesn't have to be. Like, not, not at all. If you even, even see these examples here, there are emojis, there's no punctuations. So, it doesn't have to be, it can be documents. Yeah, it'll try its best. <laughs> Yeah, so we're going to see some examples. Yeah, so we'll see some examples. I'll, I'll do something live. Uh, but yes, yeah, so a, a variety of use cases. So you can do things like look at customer and public satisfaction. You can monitor your company's social media. You can combine this with other modeling approaches to predict your sales performance. So you can see how you know, all this stuff can kind of compound and, and work together. Think about but, um, reviews. So Amazon, yeah. Netflix, whenever you're reviewing something, right? They're definitely processing it with the sentiment analysis and they're looking at, at those numbers. And that also goes into the recommender systems that are used in things like Amazon and Netflix because it's looking at you know, reviews of other people who look like you in terms of what you watch and trying to match it up with the other things that they like that you haven't seen and then offer you up and say, hey, did you see this yet? Okay, so I'm gonna dive straight into you know, actually showing you how I can do something like sentiment analysis using Hugging Face. So here's an example of, the, of their interface. So on the left side of the screen, you have some way for you to filter the different models. And you can see that, yep, they have about 80,000 models on their platform. But for this example, let's actually try to pull one of their sentiment analysis models. I feel like, uh, what's your name? Reach. Reach has a, uh, a sentence for you, I feel like. Okay, <laughs> all right, let me pull this up. All right. <laughs> okay, so when you click on a model, you'll be presented with a, a lot of information. So on the left side of the screen, you'll see basic information about the model. So this is an example of a sentiment analysis model made by Cardiff University. And it is actually trained on 58 million tweets, so a lot of data. And it was actually downloaded over 2 million times this month alone. So it's a very popular model that a lot of people are, are using. And on the right side of the screen, they actually provide you an interface for you to play around and experiment with, their, with this model live through the web interface. So for example, if I hit compute on this, it'll, uh, it'll uh, spit out some outputs. So what label two means is positive. Label, label one means neutral, label one means uh, negative. So in this case, it thinks that's a very positive sentiment. So for example, if I use the examples on the slide, where I can say I like pi, I hit compute, it still thinks it's positive, label two. And just to confirm it, let's try to flip it. If I say, I hate pi, compute, it flipped it and said it's, uh, it thinks it's label zero or negative. So you can see how this sort of model has already been trained and there's ways for you to tap into it and use it. And if we go back to this slide, for the nerds in the room, I, inc I include the, the code of how you can actually use this sort of model programmatically. And it basically so comes down to, hey, Hey, Hugging Face, I want to do sentiment analysis. I want this particular model. You put your sentence in, and it gives you some sort of output out. So that's an example of how it could look like programmatically. But of course, again, it can be a lot more complex than that. So you don't have to use the GUI. Like he's obviously, mo most of the time, he's using this from a Python script or you know, something that Yeah, I'm not pasting a million tweets into <laughs> the web interface. So yeah, do it programmatically. Awesome. OK, so I'm going to immediately jump into uh, the next example. So. Say that for later. <laughs> That's a special treat. It's dessert. OK. OK, so the next uh, demo I'm going to jump immediately into is summarization. So this one's kind of self-explanatory. It's basically a way for you to produce a shorter version of a document while still preserving the important bits of information. That's the, the key, making sure that what you produce is still informative. Um, so again, oh, there's a variety of use cases. So you, know, you can use that for social media marketing. You can use it to generate newsletters and press releases. Uh, you can use this for your knowledge management to be able to search or summarize large amounts of documents. So again, I'm going to dive straight into Hugging Face and so show So while you. he's pulling that up, I'm going to talk about 
there's two forms, two things we talk about with summarization. We talk about extractive, which is literally like what we used to do pre, you know, fancy models, which is where we would go in and basically sort of take like the first sentence, a middle sentence, and the last sentence, and then like stitch them together, and then you get a summary. Not terrible, but not awesome. What we have here is abstractive summarization, which is going to generate new texts, right? So it may not even be using the exact text from the thing. It's going to generate a summary very similarly, amazingly similarly to the way that you or I might write a summary of something. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to jump back to the hugging face interface. And then instead of searching for sentiment, this time I'm going to look on the left side of the screen. And there is a filter for me to say, hey, I want to grab a look at the summarization models. So I click that. And we can see that they have almost 600 models that can do summarization. I'm just going to grab this one from Facebook. As, as an example. And so, again, a very popular model. This one was downloaded over a million times this month. Uh, yes, a lot of people are using it. Uh, so they have an example already prepared for us where they have a paragraph of text about the Eiffel Tower and the idea is you'd hit compute and it can summarize this down to a couple of sentences. And you have some control over that. You can tell it, I only want one sentence, two sentences, or et cetera. Um, but I want to look at a more interesting example for y'all. So I'm going to go ahead to the Eventbrite page for this event. And here's the flyer here. I'm just going to go ahead and if you see the flyer has a few paragraphs of text, I'm just going to take this and I want it to summarize it for me. Oh. Yeah. Wow, it is, yeah, let's try this again. OK, let's copy all that. Copy, go here, and paste. So I pasted it in this text field. And I'm going to go ahead and click Compute. Might think for a couple of seconds. Oh, there you go. Uh, that's if you use their paid. If you use their paid service, otherwise they're just basically a, just ho like. It's basically just a bunch of GitHub repos, so you can use it just to pull using their their programmatic interface to basically pull from GitHub repos. So that's free. But if you want them to host it for you, that's where they, they charge. Like on, on your... You can. You can download locally. You can clone the, the projects yeah. he's going to show you. That's what they did. OK. <laughs> oh, no. Think about it. It's just you're, you're going to be downloading the models and cloning it and oh, downloading okay. it. Um, but let me just quickly go through here. So we put in those three paragraphs of text. And let me just read the summary for you that it produced. So it says, NLP is a component of artificial intelligence. It provides a computer program the ability to understand human language as it is spoken and written. The Boozown team will show attendees how NLP has evolved very rapidly in the past few years. Seats are limited at this in-demand event. Please register now. Which I think, if you can agree, is a pretty good summary of those three paragraphs of text, which didn't cost much to do. So hopefully you're connecting the dots of how this could be useful in other applications. OK. And then again, if we go back to the slides. It's a very similar interface if you want to use it programmatically as well, where you say, hey, hugging face, I want to do summarization. I want this model from Facebook. And then you can f feed in your, your, your block of text, and it'll try its best to summarize it out. Of so course, you have some this control. This code right here, are you, is that model local just for? Uh, when you run this line, it will download a copy for you. Ah, OK. So there you go. Yeah, and again, So you're stand. not hitting the API here. You're like downloading it, Yeah, and then you're so it will download it locally wherever you tell it to download. By, by default, it's a temporary thing, but you can specify download it to the specific location. Um, but yeah, so you put in a paragraph of text, and it'll try its best to summarize it for you. Um, so you can imagine if you have a big corpus, right? You're making a search engine. You would like to flip uh, a card down to show the summary of maybe what you know may very well be large documents. Um, you can do this to every document and then stick it in your uh, database. Mm -hmm. And cool, the, the last rapid, like a rapid fire demo I want to show you is an example of building a question and answer chatbot. So what is question and answer? Again, it's well, self-explanatory. It's the ability to answer a question given some sort of text or context. And there's tons of applications. The most common one is chatbots. For example, we can have a bot, when a customer asks a question, it can try to pull from some FAQ. So it's like a massive list of commonly asked questions. They can try to answer it for you based off of that content. And of course, you can semantically search through hundreds or thousands of documents using something like this. So I'm going to go back to the interface. It can even do things like you know, making reservations or um, you know, 
obviously the, the question and answer, but there's a lot of, people get really creative with these, uh, the way that the Q&As work nowadays. It's pretty cool. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the Hugging Face Interface, but this time I'm gonna go into the common tasks and go and click on question answering. And we can see, again, they have over 2,000 models to do question answering. I'm going to grab this one as an example. This one was downloaded 800,000 times this past month. So again, popular model. And the way that uh, question answering works is a little different than the other ones, where this time you have to put two things in as input. The first is the question you want to ask, and the next is the context for that it can answer the question from. So for example, they uh, that they have prepared here. Let me zoom in a little more, go to this side. They have this large paragraph of text talking about the Amazon rainforest, and they could ask a question like, uh, which name is also used to describe the Amazon rainforest in English? And it'll try to answer that question from that paragraph of text. So if I hit compute, it'll say Amazonia or the Amazon jungle. So it try to it pick that out from that uh, context. But again, let's try to look at a more interesting example of question answering. Let's go ahead and delete all this, and let's again paste the content for this flyer. And what we can do is we can ask questions about the content of this flyer, such as, when is the event? I'll hit compute. Let's get think for a little bit. Model loading. That's the downside of the free version. You have to wait. You're all sharing servers. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, if you want to stick this on a machine with some more power that's local to you, then it's going to be a lot faster. Yeah, you don't have to wait. <laughs> Let's give it another couple seconds. There you go. And it says October 13th, which I think is pretty accurate. So it scrubbed through that, that body of text and said, oh, that's when the event is. And we can ask you know, more questions like, what time is check-in? Question mark. Hit compute. Hopefully, you don't have to wait too long. It said 3 PM. So you can immediately see how you can connect the dots, how this can be useful for other applications, where if you have Oh, try thousands. this one. I got one for you. What does Ed do? Oh, let's see. What? Talked a lot. What does Ed do? I think we asked what was Ed's role, but no, let's no, do, but do a different yeah. one. Do a different one. This is more ambiguous. Oh, enlightening session. So, oh, so that so that that's nice. a perfect example. <laughs> that's a perfect example. Some of these models aren't perfect out of the box. So that's like specifically when you have to have you know some sort of team to help you fine tune it. Maybe choose a different. Or model. you ask a better question. When you that ask it what his role is, it comes up with the right thing. Yes, sir. Question. So, our call center records. Oh, there you go. Uh huh. Can you go in and use this tool to scan those conversations to determine what's the most frequent question that's being asked by members or providers? You could, but first you have to change the audio into text. So you need to do the speech to text. And then, absolutely, yeah, that's just a matter. You don't even need a QA for that, right? You just need to look at like document similarity, and the questions would each be a document in that case. And back to this, so I tried a, a different example of more, uh, you know, what is Ed's role, and then it says director of CTO. So I was able to pull that information out of the, the document. Um, so that includes like the, the three quick demos I want to show off. So again, Google, Meta, et cetera, they invested large amounts of money to these models that people can yes, just reuse. Yes, ma'am. Is there one that you can look up that was audio that could just do that, that part of the job? Oh, we could, yeah. If, uh, we, 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 maybe we don't do it. Uh, we don't have a demo of that. But if you look on the side of the screen, but they do have there hugging face for sure. see, audio uh, text to speech yep. or audio to audio. or Yeah, there's some really good ones out there. Yeah, it's, um, it's really speech fun. It's basically like you know, taking, that, taking that spectrogram of the audio into, sometimes they'll actually put it into a computer vision model, right? And then it's, it's taking a picture, it's, it's using that picture of the audio to then make it into text. And then that text, we then do lots of NLP with. Like it can even look at the, like the shape of your lips as you're talking and use that to inform it as well. So a lot of really complex stuff. And again, we didn't have a demo prepared, but you can see there, there's a ton of things already in Huggy Face. And again, there are other platforms that have the same amount of uh, models. And you can see, yeah, yeah, audio to audio, text to speech. There's speech to text somewhere over here. So yeah. So Hugging Face, speech to text. All right. Yeah, and there and there's similar open source platforms out there. Yeah, to there's Hugging a ton. Face. This just happens to be currently probably the most popular, popular. Mm -hmm. when you're wanting to do an NLP solution. Yeah, and it really does become an accelerant because there are other things when you're looking at an N10 solution that you still have to build as an organization and expertise you have to bring, but it kind of plugs in a big piece of it. Yep, that is is that, and and also just you know, Kaimi did some very simple examples, but 
those examples are very complex examples. Under the hood, yeah, about, very, yeah. When you think about sentiment, that's a very complicated <laughs> scientific thing, and yet it was just boiled down and made made to look easy. But a lot, all three of these things require expertise from your organization to train the model, right? It, this is a starting point. You need to, t uh, Summer was saying, you need to fine tune it. You need to train it with your expertise. You might be looking at the language differently, the context differently. So you still have to bring your experts to make the model more, have more fidelity within your organization. And you still have to do some investment. But those three things, as, as kind of fun and easier as they look at, are really replicating extremely manual and non, kind of non-exact functions that many organizations are spending countless hours and money of man hours to do. And yet, this is kind of almost automating a lot of those functions. So even if you were to use it at its most base level, you're probably gaining 60 70% efficiency and still maybe doing some 20 30% manual, but you're kind of saving all that time up front. And then even to kind of increase that threshold to have the algorithms do more, you're just kind of investing more into it. But it's pretty complex things that are now just kind of at your fingertips um, that you could bring into your organization. When you say having your own experts, what if you don't have those experts? How do you manage that? I mean, expert is a relative term. Right. Um, you yeah. know, I don't think that you need a, a doctorate in linguistics, right, to run one of these models. I think that you just really, you need someone the, that knows their way around the code. And then depending on what you want to do, if you just want to use the model out of the box, you may not necessarily need somebody that understands how to tune that model at all. You just need somebody that's proficient in maybe software engineering. Python, yeah. yeah. For example, I'll, I'll give an example. So the summer's up here. Maybe expert's the wrong word. But an example of how we use it in the DOD is we're looking at military O plans or documentation, right? When I say expert, it's not necessarily an expert. It's someone who understands those documents. Exactly. Right? So me, who didn't serve in the military, but yet I service military clients, I need someone who understands that language and the context. Uh -huh. I can't have a model look at that like a document unless there's an expert or someone who's familiar with it to say this is the sentiment, right? This is slang, or this is official doctrine, or this is what they mean, or this acronym, acronym means that. So when you're talking about a chat bot and you're kind of wanting to look at data, it's really like asking the person who's going to use it. Yep. Like the end user that wants to get some kind of like insight out of it. It's almost sitting with a developer and saying, here's the words I want you to flag. Yep. Here's the things that I want you to look for. Yep. Here's the things that mean the most to me. And then the developer then tunes the model to that. So experts kind of like not that. It's just sort of like, who's going to do something with the, the data? And what do you want from it? And asking them what they want from it. And then if you wanted to, let's say, fine tune that model, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow your minds. So think about how you would use sentiment analysis on something like tweets when people are sarcastic or being ironic, emojis is easier, right? Because, well, unless they're using it sarcastically, right? Because they're saying the opposite of what they mean. Now you have a new problem. And this is actually not at all solved, but this is a different case, right? So you need somebody that's an expert in your data to say, are we gonna throw them out? Are we gonna try and detect those somehow? We had an engagement with the um, Veterans Experience Office where they were trying to understand how the veterans felt about, I believe it was the VA. And so they were dealing with a lot of people that were being like sarcastic and some of them were, were actually happy and some of them were not. And so it was a really a big hurdle for them to, to have to analyze that. The other thing is that, you know, if you are gonna fine tune that model on, <coughs> let's say the irony or the sarcasm, that's where you're gonna need a data scientist. You don't necessarily need an expert data scientist per se, but you're going to need somebody that understands, one, the transformer models, and two, how to tune those models, right? Because they need to know that, like, oh, this model is sucks. Why? And what can I do to make it better? So those are kind of the, the cases where you may actually, you know, it just depends on how deep you want to go and how customized you want to be. Question over here. Well, I was just maybe to hopefully add to the... Oh, yes, please.
COVID. Oh, yeah. How do I get through with this app and having all these problems? Right. right. So the state of Hawaii actually had to have people sitting there reviewing all this data, right, and saying, well, yeah, we didn't answer that question, I guess. Now we got to add some more information into the model uh -huh. so that it knows when people start asking Totally, yeah. Ideally, ideally, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, in fact, that's part of what we have to do as technologists, which is to educate people sometimes, because they're like, oh, you built a tool, cool, see you later. And I'm like, well, somebody should probably like keep you know, messing with it, even if it's not necessarily us. So this is kind of like part of the, <laughs> the education that you may have to do for your, uh, your folks as well. Yes, sir. So I think, um, you know, from a data scientist perspective, a lot of times, and I don't know if you've ever taken like an online course in, in data science or ML, you know, machine learning, is that it sometimes it creates kind of this silo space that says, you know, like everything's model centric, right? Like uh -huh. There's this entire ecosystem that surrounds the model. Right. How do I take a model and productionalize that model? And sometimes I think there's this missing dynamic between the data science world, the machine learning engineering world, and the software development world. You got that right. Saying, you know, I mean, these demos you showed, you know, that's great, but obviously if my company wants to implement something like this, I'm not gonna just hire 200 people to sit on Hubby Place and, and type in people's things. There's oh, heck no. There's an automation no. process. Oh, yeah. And there's model degradation where models have to be retrained over time because data changes. Um, so I'm wondering, like, what, um, who is Alan Hamilton's framework, and it doesn't have to be like your, you know, your custom framework. I mean, there's tons of different frameworks out there. But what your framework is for saying the model is just this piece. When I put the model into production and I'm talking to my CEO about why did I just give you guys fifty million dollars to make, you know, this system? There's this entire data engineering, you know, yeah. data science, ML engineering, ML ops. Support. Absolutely. So what kind of is, what's the system or the considerations that you guys make when thinking about going into an organization and implementing a NLP solution? So, yeah, you yeah, you're hitting my sweet spot. So I'm getting pretty good at doing, we call these rough order of magnitudes. So um, what they'll say is, all right, Summer, you want to build a prototype, you want to build the search engine, what's it going to cost me? So I sit down with my team and I'm like, all right, what do we need? So after doing this a few times, you know, we've seen that what you need is, it kind of depends. I mean, ideally you're gonna have this in the cloud. Like really, really you should. Like if, if not, like in production, it just really needs to be in the cloud. So you need somebody to manage the cloud stuff. You need a person for this. This is not like something that somebody's just gonna learn on the fly. There's a lot going on. Um, and they're gonna have to manage that aspect of it always. They may not always need to manage it at like 100%, let's say, but especially at the beginning, you're gonna need them to set that stuff up, and then they're gonna have to kind of deal with the incidents, you know, when it goes down, or when AWS decides to turn something off, and you have to restart the, you know, Docker hub or whatever. Um, you're then gonna need software engineers for sure. I always go with like maybe a couple of back end and a front end engineer. Um, sometimes people are full stack, but that's a very rare, it's a unicorn, especially in Hawaii, it's very hard to find people that know both and also not always super necessary, right? So um, you'll, you'll need somebody to deal with the back end, sort of the Python or the Java or whatever you wanna do. And then the front end, you're gonna have to make a decision, right? What do you wanna code that front end in? Is it gonna be Angular? Is it gonna be React? Is it gonna be, you know, whatever. Um, and then you're also going to, of course, need some sort of a data scientist, but it does depend, right? If you don't necessarily need to deal with model drift or customization, you may not need um, as senior of a data scientist. Maybe you can have a junior person who, you know, does some experimentation and then kind of learns with you. Um, and so then that team is also going to need Ideally, you want a user experience person in there, right? Like somebody who can help you out with design, but can also sit with that SME and be like, all right, what does the user need? Because the engineers, 
you know, it's almost like, um, it's like editing your own text, right? You don't see the typos and the misspellings because you wrote it. Engineers, we have a hard time like seeing the issues with the stuff we create because we're not the users. Like we can try and test it, we're gonna do that. That's another person that you're gonna need eventually. It depends on how big your system is, right? Maybe your backend engineer can also fill this role, but you're gonna need Q&A um, and just so, some sort of like quality testing from that designer UX person to say, all right, these are the things that need to work before we push to production. Um, and so that team is then gonna need like probably a scrum master slash PM, which may or may not work together. I mean, may or may not be the same person um, just so that you establish some kind of rhythm, some kind of ticketing, et cetera. So that's kind of like your, your minimum kind of um, if you're productionalizing. If you're building a prototype, go for it. Like get a couple of people together, do it locally, just go for it. You write a quick Python script. and But yeah, you're, you're touching on a very important topic, which is MO ops or how you can take your models from experimentation to production Sorry. is widely going to vary depending on the project itself. Yeah. If you're running a pilot project, you just need some place to experiment, maybe some sort of data processing if data is big, and then maybe some way to track some like metadata and artifacts. If you're, meanwhile, if you want to do a project where you're doing frequent retraining. You need a completely set of different tools to support that. You need CI CD, uh, model registries, and blah, blah, blah. You need a lot of other stuff. CI CD is continuous integration, continuous development, where you know, you're know you always able to kind of incorporate and push to push back code back into production. Um, there are lots of tools that help you do that too, which your cloud engineer is going to help you set up. <laughs> is that anybody else have comments about what you would add? Yes, sir. Models? Yeah, like proprietary models. That, that yeah, there's, um, like I mean, especially what, so what we do in the DoD space, there's a lot of models out there that are, there's a lot of Silicon Valley um, AI niche companies that provide models that do very specific things, right? Whether it's like geospatial, a lot of intelligence models, things we do for national security. So those models are pr proprietary and they're trained for very specific uses. These open source models are really good in the right context. Right, if you're looking at something that's not as um, risky to your business, right? If it's something that you're trying to get some efficiencies and kind of automation or kind of using something open source accelerates it. But if there's other thresholds, like, like I mentioned risk a lot, but also the data is very proprietary and you want to kind of look at it in a different way, of course, there's kind of like the proprietary market and there's the open source market. So it just kind of depends on the use, right? Um, a lot of this is really a lot of asks that people have around AI are, are, first, they're not kind of in the AI realm, right? They're kind of in the ML realm, and they're a little bit lower complexity. And they're really just trying to introduce some efficiencies to the organization, which is really great to use some of the open source models. I think as you get more complex and you're looking at more different data, then you're going to go into the proprietary place and even kind of invest in your own teams to build those models themselves, right? It's kind of more of a business trade-off that you had to make. And then, and then to, to John's question earlier is, um, this would be a five hour um, talk if we talked about all the components that go into it, right? So when, when, when any end user wants something in the realm of AI or close to it, it's, it's sort of at the end, it's like the pot of gold, right? What we spend a lot of time is educating clients on all the foundational pieces you need to get there, right? First, you still have to have the right data, right? That's number one. You have to know what data you have, you have to have enough of it, then you have to know how to ingest it, clean it, tag it, so basically to make it consumable, that's a big investment just to get there, right? To get your data to a place that's consumable and now you can actually do something with it. Then once it's there, which, which means you would have addressed uh, data engineering, automation, deploy, um, kind of like the, uh, what we call assemble, that's kind of our proprietary model of how we train models and deploy models. Once you even get to that point, now you're talking about what models do you want to use on that data. So there's a lot of things that we spend time talking with clients. They have to get found, you have to get foundational pieces in first before you can even get to some of this, but then that would be a whole nother conversation. But it's, it is an important conversation, 
right? It's not like you can just go from this to this overnight. There's a lot of things that you have to consider there, and there's a lot of ancillary services that you have. But, but again, it's still more accessible than it was in the past. And speaking of InfoSec, you definitely need an InfoSec person. But for us, it's kind of baked into the cake, so I didn't mention that. But a lot of times, uh, cloud folks also tend to be versed in this. So sometimes you get lucky and you can get a uh, sort of a cloud sec ops, if you will, so cloud security ops person to kind of handle uh, those issues. But that doesn't address what you're talking about, which is like, does using an open source model make me vulnerable to somebody who understands that model and wants to do an attack on my system? And the answer is like, yeah, probably, right? Um, but it depends on the type of attack, right? Like, what could they do? And a lot of times, we, we, we're at the place where we're like, well, if they're already that far in, we got a way bigger problem than the model. So, <laughs> but you know, these are important considerations. Um, all right, so being mindful of time, um, we will sort of, we'll quickly go through some of our um, use cases and, and some examples here. Okay. Yeah, try to go through it quick. So these are just, just some examples of, of using those tools I mentioned previously, those hugging face models in an application that actually our recent batch of Summer Games interns actually worked on this project. So I'm going to quickly introduce it about using or analyzing so social media data. So their goal was to analyze social media data uh, by implementing existing models from hugging face, uh, focused on detecting bot generated content and, and classifying hate speech. And given the federal government orientation of Booz Allen, they decided to focus on the Philippines' public perspective of the U.S.-China conflict. So they wanted to look at tweets around that topic and analyze and look for misinformation, bot generated content, and et cetera, using those tools on Hugging Face in order to generate interactive dashboards and reports so that um, you know, the end user can generate some sort of actionable insight from all that social media data. Um, so that sounds great, but how did they actually do this project? Well, step one is data collection. AI means absolutely nothing without data. That's probably the most important lesson. Um, so they used a tool called Zigno, which is the way for you just to pull data from a variety of social media platforms, such as Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Instagram, and, and all that. So they can, but in this particular case, they focused on Twitter first, and they actually were able to pull over 5 million tweets related to this, the subject. And that brings me to the next step, which is how do you analyze that much information? Uh, they used a, a cloud-based platform called Databricks to, to analyze all that sort of social media data. Real quick, you don't have to scrape this. Zignal is a great company that we partner with. Yeah. Uh, there are a ton of them, though, that collect this type of social media data, et cetera. And so if you were wanting to, let's say, put your reviews together with like Amazon or something, there are aggregators, and you basically pay a fee, and you can get tons of data, and it's very useful. Yeah, you're not going to Twitter yourself. Zignal's doing it for you. <laughs> um, I mean, but you can build a web scraper, but. You could. <laughs> Um, so yeah, once we have all that data, how do you analyze it? So again, we use data, or they use Databricks, which is a cloud-based platform to analyze large amounts of data with scalable computing. And the idea is that they actually then used the models from Hugging Face to analyze those, uh, those tweets. For example, they, they applied three models during their, their time. They, the first was sentiment analysis, actually using that Cardiff University model I showed previously. They, did a, they used another model to do topic uh, uh, classification. So was this tweet talking about film or music or news, just so they can quickly tag the data so they can do uh, future filtering and sorting. And the last model is an example of a more niche application where th there was a model that tries to predict whether or not that Twitter account may be state-owned or state-operated, so belonging to some sort of government organization. Um, then from there, they can take all the results and generate you know, interactive dashboards and reports and the like. Um, I'm just going to quickly blaze through like um, one example of their automated reports that get generated. So as data gets dumped into the environment, it can actually update live. So, but you can see things like, you can see the breakdown of the different topics that were categorized within their, um, their 5 million tweets, for example. Uh, you know, two thirds related to news and social concern, while there was some that talked about film, TV, and, and music. So you can immediately filter those out and not, not worry about them. Um, other visualizations like, hey, we can look at the text information of those tweets and try to tag where, what, what, what countries were mentioned in those tweets and kind of visualize them geographically, like ch you know, how many times was the US mentioned or China or et cetera. Um, here's an example of another visualization called a word cloud, which just shows you very quickly uh, the most common terms mentioned within, that, you know, within all the tweets. And you can see some, you know, the bigger the word is, the more common it was or more frequent. So you can see different words popping out and a ton of other visualizations, for example, this report at the bottom uh, is looking at specific accounts of interest and determining how much negative information they're spewing into the environment. So for example, this person 
tweeted 2,000 things that were perceived as negative and zero things that were positive. So that's an example of like you can <laughs> look at specific you know, accounts of interest. Yeah. OK. Awesome. I'll pass it over to you, Summer. OK. Oh, uh, yeah. So let's look at a search engine. Next slide, please. So here we have a client. Um, so this is a slide I did with our client for a conference. Um, so this is with, um, it's actually made for the US Forces Japan, which is why it's called the Japan US Search Tool, AKA Joust. Um, so they basically came and they said, all right, we've got 60 years of documents in a bunch of filing cabinets. Can you help us make um, these PDFs searchable? Or can you make them into PDFs and then make them searchable? And I was like, we can do better than that. So what we did was we did scan them in and we used something called you know, OCR to basically take it from a picture to text. Um, and then we made a search engine and a data repository of like 80 years of these hard copy documents, which then continues to get these like newer digital copies every time they, they produce them. And so it's sort of this, uh, it's just basically a search engine, right? It's, it's like a little Google for their stuff. Um, OCR is fun, optical character recognition. So if you don't know this, I'm sure you use it <laughs> um, because it's what Adobe is doing a lot of the time and what most modern scanners and printers automatically do for you, essentially on its way from becoming a, a paper to a picture. So it's making a layer of recognizing these characters as text and creating a text layer. So whenever you can search a PDF, that's already been done for you. Sometimes we do our own stuff. So for example, they wanted signatures detected. So we used a little bit of like computer vision to detect when there was like handwriting and, and things like that. Um, this is just an example of how you can sort of use clustering. I'm not gonna get into it. More entity extraction. Um, and then we have topic modeling, which is again, just tagging. Um, this was a graphical database, so if you're familiar with graph theory, um, where we actually use the tags from this topic model as the nodes, and then the edges are the documents that have, sorry, documents are also nodes, and then the edges are whether they contain um, these terms. So, sorry about that. Um, and then that allows us to then look at like a couple things. If you're already looking at a document, you can say what's similar. So couple ways you can get similarity. One is just like, like tags and entities, but another is these neighborhoods here. Um, and this. Or hugging face, maybe. <laughs> for similarity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, large language model can definitely be used. This is actually a very lightweight solution. So we didn't have GPUs. We didn't really have a lot of sort of heavy hitting compute power or money. Um, so we, I. I pride myself here on getting the job done without having to go there. But yes, we absolutely can. We showed them that and they, they thought it was cool. So definitely show them the demo regardless. Next slide, please. All right, here's a healthcare application. Uh, all right, so this is the Shakespeare project. I did this with the FDA a few years ago. We just finally published the papers from it. Basically, she, so the client was an epidemiologist at the FDA, Rosalie Bright, uh, and she loved this, this conundrum of like using uh, NLP to figure out if Shakespeare actually wrote all of his plays or if there were different authors. Um, there's also kind of a fun sort of tutorial about the Federalist Papers, like who wrote them based on like NLP analysis. Um, Cause there's like three writers, right? Like Hamilton and, and Madison, anyway. So Shakespeare Project got its name that way. Next slide, please. So the idea was, um, there, there were adverse events happening after blood transfusions. And what the problem is the FDA and the medical community in general doesn't pick up on that until it's already a pretty big problem because the signal has to get pretty strong for them to go, oh my gosh, we're missing something here, right? It's not like the doctors are going, oh, this is an adverse event after a blood transfusion. It's really something that they're not connecting, right? So that is the kind of thing we want to avoid by trying to detect it sooner. Um, so this is a case where by the time they figured it out, um, it was already pretty bad. And then the, the FDA comes in and says, all right, 
We need to be doing less blood transfusions. Let's make these requirements stricter, especially for these really sick patients in the ICU, because it's causing some other, um, other problems, right? So we call these problems adverse events. Next slide, please. So the idea is we took a corpus of um, medical notes, just the notes, not the structured data, to uh, look and see if we could find information just in the note section that led us to understand or pull out at least, or narrow down rather, um, the patients that had an adverse event after a blood transfusion. And the epidemiologists were really adamant that we only look at the notes because they, always, they would say that sometimes that structured data is wrong and it doesn't contain the richness that you get in a lot of these medical notes where they're gonna sort of expand on things. Because a diagnosis code, if you didn't know to diagnose it as a blood transfusion adverse event, it's not gonna be there, right? But it might be here. So this is the one, the first problem we encountered was like there were all these duplicates, which was sort of artificially inflating the importance because what happens is the nurse, so let's say Kaimi comes in the hospital and he's in there for like three days and the nurse on the third day copies the day one and two, pastes it into today's notes and then types her notes below. This happens a lot in medicine, like a lot. So what happens is you've got like day one copied like 10 times in a 10 day stay. So we wanted to get, that's called note bloat for an official medical term here. Um, and so we wanted to get rid of that. So we wrote a fun little Python library called bloatectomy um, to basically get rid of it. So it's like a plagiarism detection, but instead of just saying yes, no, and detecting it once, we wanted to detect every iteration of those copies. And it highlights it or pulls it out or whatever you wanna do. Next slide, please. Oh, back one more, sorry. This is a good example of why you need a SME. I don't know what any of this means. I'm just the one that writes the code. So I had to sit with epidemiologists and be like, does this look good? Because they, I mean, it's, it's, it might as well be another language. So this is also why a lot of these like Hugging face, for example, not a great, well, it didn't exist at the time, but not a great solution because this is very specific language. It's almost a different language. So we would need to train the model specifically on this or fine tune a hugging face model on this data. This is a great use case for that. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm not gonna get too into the weeds here, but basically we had to train a a simple model, so not a fancy one, just a basic naive Bayes on who was transfused and who was not. The reason we did this was to pull out those patients that, the words rather, that highly correlated to transfused patients. Also, we wanted to only look at transfused patients for obvious reasons. What was so cool and told me that my model worked perfectly <laughs> Um, is because, so what you can do, so this is a highly interpretable model, which is bueno. Um, so you have the importance of the features, which are just words in this case, for the non-transfused patients and the important, most important features for the transfused patients that we can pull out of here. Um, PRBCS is like um, red blood cells, uh, transfused, PC, packed, uh, so it's like packed blood, like one unit, two units, things like that. Uh, bump, so they often refer to it as like another like bump for like a unit. Um, okay, concerns, very interesting stuff. So this she actually did because she wanted to get rid of these because she wasn't interested in the common words, but we're not gonna get into that. What's fun here? Look at the most important term that that model used to figure out for sure someone did not have a blood transfusion. Anybody know why this is here? Anybody? Just point at this one. <laughs> the top word. Jehovah Witness. Jehovah Witness, because that this is a religious practice where they are not allowed to transfuse these patients. And these are all ICU patients. So they're probably not communicative. So they're writing that down in the notes so that nobody makes a mistake to transfuse somebody that absolutely does not want it. So I this I did not expect. And at first I was like, why is that coming? Oh, got it. So this was like the kind of fun stuff that can come out of this. Keep going. Uh, not really gonna touch on this, just gonna say we did some um, 
topic modeling, which is basically like grouping and tagging. Um, and then we looked at the people that were in the edges of these topics or groups. This is where we pulled out people that had adverse events. Next slide, please. So we were able to pull out some things that, you know, basically were not caught at the time, but like looking back, we said, oh, this is actually a problem. So there were some like pulmonary events that were more likely from the transfused patients than the non-transfused uh, or even just the random transfused admissions. Uh, next slide, please. Also cardiac issues uh, that were common that kind of came out and we have some like top, top words for that as well. Next slide, please. So most of these, we call them potential adverse events um, that were found were not actually attributed in the notes. Like nobody typed, oh, I think this happened because the transfusion. Like it was not attributed in the notes, but we were able to kind of pull that, pull out those patients and look at them and say, yeah, this is probably something to look at. It wasn't perfect. It didn't say like these 10 people had adverse events, but what it did was it took us from a million records to like 10. That then that's manageable, right? An epidemiologist can actually look at those 10 and go, okay, I can, I can digest this. Whereas like half a million, what are you gonna do? Uh, next slide, please. These are just some of the papers we did, some of the GitHub. So we made it all public because this was with FDA and you know, open source is important. Um, these are my colleagues. Uh, that's it. Next slide, please. All right. I feel like we've already done this. Next slide, please. Yeah, we kind of already did this, people. So I mean, this whole section is about just general advice in order to adopt naturalized processing. But if you want to just open it to questions or anything you want sure. to Sure. No, anything you, you had to add? Um, no, actually, do you want to add anything to this section as general advice for? No, I mean, we'll kind of open it up. I mean, we just wanted to, um, if we had time, but I know we're close to that, and there's wine and beer in the back, so I don't want to hold anybody back from that. But, um, but really, maybe um, as we kind of network and talk, we're more than happy to talk through some of the starting points through some of this. You know, John had a good point. I mean, there, there's a lot of building blocks that have to go into getting to some of these solutions, um, and it's really having that view of an ecosystem and kind of a holistic view of how you can actually do that. But, um, but it's just like the possibilities are, are endless and we just wanted to take some time to show some use cases and talk this technology through. But, but I think we'll wrap it up. And, and I do want to say thank you to Leilani and True for, for putting on this event. She makes everything look very easy and it's always like coordinated. But um, really this is just one way that we, we, we want to bridge the gap between what our company does for the DOD sector but also work with all the smart technologists here on island really it's really on all of us to help um whether it's our clients whether it's our teams whether it's our communities to embrace technology to make the economy more diverse in terms of where we can take it other than kind of the tourism industry other places and so events like this are really important right we can geek out on some of the technology but it's really for all of us to get to know one each other to share ideas and see how we can take it back to our respective teams so we want to thank all of you guys for coming in and taking some time out of your afternoon, I'm sure, away from work and families and your schedule. So um, I want to thank Summer and Kaimi for doing a great presentation. Um, and that's it. And, and we're going to be hanging around uh, for a few minutes. So if you have questions, um, please let us know. Please come introduce yourselves. But we want to say thank you for being here. Thank Appreciate you it. Time.